Hello and welcome everyone. I am Kelly Haran. I'm a Montessori trained elementary guide um, and I'm a member of our programs team here at Guidepost Montessori. I'm really looking forward to this topic today. Um, if you were here and joined us a couple of weeks ago for the getting their attention ideas for helping kids focus, um, you have already had the pleasure of hearing from our presenters today. Um, I would love to actually, before I do introductions, to test out the questions tab. So if you could let us know where you're joining us from, um, and if there's anything else you'd like us to know, like if you're a parent or an educator, that can also just be helpful so that we know who our audience is. We've got Montclair, Virginia. Sarah, joining from Virginia. Ah, oh, that's my friend, Sarah. <laughs> Ooh, someone from Portugal. It's exciting. If you're just joining us, I was asking folks to find the questions tab so you can familiarize yourself to where that is and just let us know where you're joining us from because it's exciting. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon from Washington County, Maryland. We know Ms. Barber very well. <laughs> and we've got a couple of our guide post guides. Well, great. I know people are continuing to write in, um, so thank you for that. Um, I'd just like to let everybody know that we are going to be recording this webinar. So if you want to revisit this or share it with others later, it will be posted on the Guidepost Montessori YouTube channel. And I would love to introduce our guest today um, from the Montessori Medical Partnership for Inclusion. We have Catherine Massey, um, and she's been studying and researching Montessori education and special education um, and the powerful impact of combining the two. She got her Montessori diploma um, in Bergamo, Italy, and she has a master's in teaching elementary as well as special education. She is also a Montessori mom of four, um, an ORF music teacher, a Montessori teacher, a dyslexia tutor, and a Montessori school director. Um, she founded two Montessori public charter schools in Maryland, um, including the very first one. And she's traveled internationally and presented advocating for inclusive Montessori um, through integrated application of scientific and medical pedagogy. And we also have Barbara Laborski. She's a pediatric occupational therapist um, with over 25 years of experience as a developmental practitioner. And she is also a Montessori mom. Um, Barbara has expertise in the links between occupational therapy or OT and Montessori education. So she's provided workshops and consultations at Montessori schools. Um, and she's focused on inclusion in Montessori. Barbara has also presented internationally, um, including at the Montessori World Congress on these topics and more. So at this point, I would love to turn things over to Catherine um, and then Barbara will share after this. Thank you for these um, wonderful introductions, Kelly. And thank you for having us back again. I wanna welcome all, welcome all the parents and teachers to this opportunity to discuss reluctant writers and readers. Uh, Barbara came up with that title. I love it. Um, but those, you know, we, those children who don't seem to be embracing literacy in the way that we're accustomed to for children of their age. Um, Barbara and I will present some in, in just a half an hour, 15 minutes each, we'll present some very general outlines of some of the more common challenges these kiddos might be experiencing. And then we'll open it up to your questions to see if we can um, answer any of your questions for you. So I'm um, going to start out talking a little bit about observation, then differential diagnosis, then supporting literacy development, and then Orton Gillingham. I will probably speak pretty fast because there's <laughs> a lot to cover. Um, I want to start out um, under the topic of observation. Um, and of course, observation is the foundation of Montessori education with a quote from Dr. Montessori that she wrote um, many, many, many years ago. These are lectures from um, night that were recorded from her lectures in 1915. So she says, experience has taught me that there is a remarkable difference between reading and writing and there that there is not an absolute concurrency between the two acts. Although it may appear strange, writing precedes reading. 
So um, she was really ahead of her time in that discovery that she made through observation. And that's how powerful observation can be. And it was her unbiased observations of children's learning that is the foundation of her entire method. But it wasn't until the 1980s that the um, the ling lingui linguistics, the science of um, linguistics, accepted finally, yes, writing naturally comes before reading. And I would love to give you an hour lecture on that, but there's not time here. So when Montessorians talk about reading and writing, often they say writing and reading, because um, in the Montessori method, we teach writing first. So, um, and when you think about your child's development of literacy, just keep that in mind, how important uh, writing is to start with. So in observation, we observe what the child freely chooses, right? Follow the child. But um, for people working and specializing in special education and children with differences, we know that it's just as important to observe what they avoid. And children who have um, challenges in reading and writing will avoid reading and writing like the plague. So uh, that's, but that's important information because that tells you to start looking more carefully there. All right, so some of the aspects that, um, that Joyce Pickering, who's a speech and language pathologist and a uh, very well-known Montessorian, she talks about four areas to pay attention to when you're thinking about your child's um, uh, functioning and development. Coordination, language, attention, and perception. And it forms the word clap. Coordination, language, attention, and perception. So when so it just it helps to guide your observations of your child to think about those different areas. Barbara's going to talk about um, coordination and um, when she speaks, so I won't go into that. Um, in terms of language observation, it's really important to think about um, your child's development of language over um, from the very earliest stages, so through their whole life. And you know, do they have little quirks? Little are they making mistakes in their oral language? So oral language is really important as a foundation to reading and writing development. Um, attention, which we talked about a couple of weeks ago at length, um, having attentional challenges or um, deficits in attention can interfere with learning, uh, um, reading and writing. And then perception, um, children with dyslexia and language learning differences uh, have a um, neurological differences that create differences in how they perceive auditory and visual information. So that's a really important thing to remember. The other thing to look at when you're thinking about your child's um, spontaneous reading and writing in their daily lives, think about the environment. Are there factors in the environment that are interfering with, the, with them having an interest in reading and writing? Um, or are there, you know, there are, what are the ways that you can enhance the environment in a way so that they will make, be making those choices more often? Um, and then the last thing is genetics. Um, dyslexia and ADHD are very genetically um, heritable and are widespread in families. So if you have relatives or um, family members who have dyslexia or ADHD, both which impact reading and learning, reading and writing, then it's something that you should really t pay attention to. Um, so, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, differential diagnosis, just so that you have this in the back of your mind as you do your observations. You really wanna find out as early as possible if your child has a learning difference. And um, because the in early intervention window goes until about six or seven years old. And if you know, the earlier you know, and can get in there and help the child, you can actually change the way the child's brain develops to a more typical pathway. And um, Dr. Montessori wrote about this 100 years ago, and it's well known in, um, in neuroscience. So learning differences are actually neurodevelopmental disorders. They're a neurobiological difference in their brains. And so therefore it affects their um, ability to do lots of things. And specifically it's been um, linked to learning to read and write. So again, during that uh, first plane of development when the child's brain is still um, developing and changing and growing, that's the ideal time to get in there and try to help them out. So, um, and then the other thing is if you get a diagnosis of, of dyslexia, it's 
you need to go and find out, you know, the, a differential diagnosis. So what specific areas is your child struggling with? Um, and uh, dyslexia is, is almost com always combined with other things. So you really need to look at a full um, evaluation, looking at attention, visual motor, you know, thyroid condition, lead, you know, lead in, in their system can also affect their ability to read. So even if you address the dyslexia part with you get in and start tutoring, if your child also has attentional challenges, then you still need to address that piece or you won't, or they still will not be able to optimally um, develop their re writing and reading. So, um, so anyways, and then um, for children who have these differences in the way their brains are working, it's very anxiety producing. And so if it's not identified early, they almost always develop an anxiety disorder or, or even um, develop trauma disorders when they, if they've been in school, say elementary school and, and they're like in third or fourth grade and they've been, you know, they have had expectations to read and write and they haven't been able to do that. Um, this is, it becomes a secondary issue that will have to be addressed. I wanna show really quickly, just so you understand, because if you don't have dyslexia or ADHD yourself, it's really hard to understand how it is to have a brain that functions differently. So I want to show you this website. Um, Kelly's going to put it up. It's called, it's understood um, is the name of the website. And they have a series of, there you go, understood.org. Fabulous website, all kinds of resources. Um, but if you, you search for through your child's eyes, let's go just up um, or actually go down on that page a little bit. <laughs> There we go, keep going a little bit more, a little bit. Oops. There you go, right there, simulations. So they have created these simulations um, of reading, writing, attention, math, and organizational issues. They're really cool. So you definitely should get on there and play around with these. And they, it, they just help give you an understanding of what it's like for children who have these um, brain differences. And then go um, down just a little bit further. These children's stories are fabulous. They're videos of kids um, at different ages um, who have different types of challenges. And they tell you themselves about, in a just amazing way, what it's like to not be able to do something that all the other kids can do easily. So um, I really recommend that. All right, we can go back. All right, so um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is um, supporting literacy development. And, um, and of course, we want to support the literacy development of all children, right? Um, with, but if a child does have one of these brain differences, then they are going to need a little bit different type of support. So I came up with, there's so many, this, this field is vast, I could speak for days on this. So I came up with five things that um, I wanted to share with you that um, I hope will be helpful. So number one is that Montessori language curriculum is absolutely fabulous. So for the typical child, it is super powerful. Kids on average, if they're in the full three-year primary cycle, will be reading years earlier than the typical child who doesn't have the advantage of the Montessori curriculum. It's absolutely fantastic. However, for children who do have brain differences, they uh, will need more. So they still benefit from the Montessori environment, um, but they will also need uh, additional um, types of, well, I'll talk to you at the end um, about the Orton exercises, but different types of skill development in order for them to successfully learn to read and write as soon as possible and write and read. Um, okay, so um, the second thing, oral language base. This is super, super important um, all the way up through um, their development. So if you have a child who has dyslexia, for example, um, you're going to need to support their language development until they're a very strong, fluent reader. And sometimes that might not be until middle school or high school. So we all know about, um, for the, the young child, the infant, toddler, even, even before they were born, singing songs and poems and, um, you know, having that oral language rich environment is so important. For children who, ha who are lagging in writing and reading, they need so much more of that because they're not getting it through the, the experiences of reading and reading books. So um, the way you read stories to young children, you know, we all do that. But if your child is not by first, second, third grade 
fluently reading and reading books, then they need to have that language through that they're missing through stories, through you can continue reading with them, or audiobooks. They have fabulous, I mean, we live in a technology world where there's just, um, you know, a million different options for audiobooks. So that's, that's a very easy thing. And so it's really important, even all the way up through elementary school and for some kids into high school, until they're strong, fluent readers, to keep their, their language, their oral language base growing. Um, if you if they're held back to the level that they're reading, they they are going to miss all the the oral development, the vocabulary that all of their um, classmates are getting. They're going to miss millions and millions of words, and so it's that's super important to remember. Also, um, uh, doing video uh, curriculum, for example, if your child is in upper elementary and not reading fluently to help them by putting on really great videos of different history or science or any type of topics so that they can learn all that vocabulary and the, the concepts and all the, the learning about the world that they can't that get through reading that all of their classmates are getting. So that's super, super important. Okay, um, sharing the love of reading and writing, finding ways in everyday life to read and write. So making a grocery list when you're going to the grocery, have your child, you know, write the grocery list or reading, you know, practicing reading a grocery list, um, writing letters. I know that's an old thing, but it's also, it's a beautiful thing that everybody appreciates, even if they don't get letters anymore very much. Writing, Montessori with, played with words and reading secret messages. So the really cool thing about reading and writing is that, you know, Reading is really is really uncovering the silent message of somebody else. So she played games by writing messages on the board and then just seeing what the kids would do when she'd write funny things for them to say or do or you know things that she knew would get a reaction. Um, and so and you know in many ways in her um, curriculum she has activities that use language playfully. Um, so that's that's a really great way of showing kids that you know language is really fun. Language is is fun to play with. Um, bigger is better. Okay, here's one that comes out of the Orton research. If the child is really struggling with reading and writing, go big. So in the um, in the early Montessori classrooms, and I don't know if you can see this. Um, yeah, you can. Whoops. See the boards, the chalkboards? The kids are using them, not the teacher. The kids are using them. And so in a lot of these early pictures, so they had almost 360 um, chalkboards, but it was for the kids to use. And so there's, there's, there's neuroscience to support that the vertical surface, writing big, engaging the arm all the way to the shoulder joint, really helps them learn so much better. Um, so if you have a whiteboard or a chalkboard at home, um, use writing messages to your child or maybe a daily saying to inspire them. There's all different ways you can do that, but getting them writing and, and enjoying moving with their whole arm, it locks it in into their brains in a stronger way. Um, and then technology. Um, when I tutor kids, I always work with the parents that over the summer when they're not tutoring every day, cursive writing, keyboarding, and then as they get close to high school, when the, the intensity of the um, reading and writing comes in, I teach them speech to text, which is really fabulous these days. So those are super, super important things. Um, now, I, I know I don't only have a couple minutes left, but I wanna um, very quickly, I'm just gonna list the activities, the skills that an Orton-Gillingham tutor, so Orton-Gillingham is the scientifically proven method for children who have dyslexia and um, language learning disabilities. And it comes out of a collaboration between a special educator and a neuroscientist. Um, it's simultaneous multisensory, very compatible and consistent with Montessori, very similar in a lot of ways, but there are differences. So there's eight skills that they go through in an Orton tutoring session each day. If your child really has, dysle has dyslexia and, and struggles, um, this is the optimal way to help them develop. And it really, it works, it's amazing. So I'm gonna go through the eight real quickly. 
One, phonological awareness, way more than we do for a typical child in Montessori. Um, repetition and practice to mastery, sound symbols and irregular words. Uh, three, learn new sound symbol linkages in a multi-sensory large motor way, a foot and a half letters, really big. Um, four, learn new irregular words in a multi-sensory way. Uh, five, practice decoding. So going from words to phrases and then sentences, which is what Montessori does, um, but much, much more controlled. Um, six, practice encoding or spelling words, phrases, sentences, and again, keeping it very restricted to only the sounds the child has mastered. Seven, um, and this comes later, it, you know, um, about third grade, working with affixes intensively. Um, eight, the last one, fluency practice. This one is not in Montessori, but it's called, it's a triple read. It's where you practice the same thing three times in a row. And it has to do with um, neurological motor functions. It has nothing to do with comprehension and reading, really, and, and, and reading for comprehension. It has to do with the physiological act of reading. So, and um, a typically developing child wouldn't be hurt by Orton, but they would be bored. They don't need it. But this is definitely needed for children who have dyslexia. So now I will pass it on to my wonderful colleague, Barbara, who will give you a lot more information. Okay, we're gonna be off to the races. Um, <clears throat> I also have a PowerPoint that Kelly's gonna put up. So, um, and I also have a lot of information. I'm probably, I'm gonna talk pretty fast, but um, I have decided to, to try to really just focus on some concrete, um tips you know some information that i feel like is very important for parents um, who are dealing with particularly the very reluctant writer okay so um first i want to talk to you about next slide um we're going to talk a lot about practicing we're going to talk about multi-sensory approach we need to really find a functional output method for for these children so um, one piece of it is, you know, practicing the cursive or practicing the keyboarding or those kinds of things. But really, as an OT, I want to stress to you that the main important thing is that this child has a functional way to show what they know. So, you know, when um, earlier it was mentioned about kids getting very frustrated or very demoralized when, um, you know, people are looking at them and, you know, a lot of times adults will say, well, why don't you just try harder? You know, and it, it is really hard for people who do not have these brain differences to understand what it's really like to live with that. And like um, Catherine was saying, look around and see that, you know, all your classmates can do this thing that that you can't do. Um, so having a way for them to really show what they know, because what will happen is a lot of times they'll narrow down what they, you know, like, how can I say what I want to say in the fewest number of words? And that's really not what we want. We want them to be learn to be more expressive. Excuse me. And I want to say also that we just, you need to keep trying different things. Okay, next slide. So um, what are your options? A lot of kids are doing printing and are having a really horrendous time. So cursive is a natural um, alternative. Now, I know in a lot of Montessori settings, they're they're introducing both together. And in a lot of Montessori settings, somehow the cursive is falling off. And I know that's kind of just, you know, different way, different ways of doing things. But so I am a big proponent of cursive. Um, keyboarding is another um, option. And then Catherine had just mentioned briefly voice to text. So first, I'm going to talk about cursive. You can go ahead. Sorry, Kelly. You can go ahead. So the first thing I'm just going to focus on a little bit is the cursive, um, which, you know, I feel is is um, a really, really important thing. So first of all, it's easier because the letters are connected. You put your pencil down and you just keep moving it, you know, so it's not like with printing where you have to think, you know, wait, is this a letter that starts at the top or starts at the bottom? Um, you just keep moving your pencil till you get to the next word. Um, I think that it's easier for them to avoid those B and D reversals. And, um, you know, I think some of the up and down ones um, are a little harder, aren't as much easier. But anyway, 
because of the way that you teach it, the order that you teach it in, I think you can help them avoid um, the reversals. Um, I think even for children who, who don't embrace cursive and say, oh, wow, this is so much easier, you still want to keep working on it because you are building some of those brain connections. And also, they, at very minimum, need to have a signature. They need to be able to sign their name on a check, sign their name on a legal document. And I believe there's, is there another one? Oh, um, this is important. As they're learning to um, form the, the cursive letters, it really helps them in their ability to read cursive. So again, even if they don't become a fluent cursive writer and, and use cursive writing a lot, if somebody hands them an important note and it's in cursive, they'll be able to read it because they've studied and they know those letters. Um, and building the brain connections, okay? And filling in forms, right? And it's still a good backup if they don't, if they don't gain and attain fluency. So um, I, I reiterate Catherine's point, go big. Um, I wanna spend just a minute talking about Blackboard versus Whiteboard. So, um, in a lot of senses, as an OT, I would say Blackboard is preferred because it, it offers more friction. So they say there's more drag and that will give the child through their arm and up into their brain more proprioceptive feedback. They'll have, it's easier for them to sort of understand what direction the, the um, chalk is moving and, you know, it's time to stop. I need to reverse all of that. Um, on the other hand, there are a lot of things about Blackboard that drive a lot of kids crazy, like the sound of it, the feel of the chalk, um, and, and for some of them, the drag. So uh, in that instance, then the whiteboard would be better for those kids because it has this very smooth, like glass kind of feeling. And so for some kids, that's really helpful. So again, you just kind of have to try it out. And I know also some of the um, dry erase markers are very, very smelly. And um, so, you know, that can be a problem. I've actually had tried some that are scented because some kids maybe can use that extra, you know, olfactory. But so you have to sort of fiddle around a little bit with that and find out. Um, in some instances, it's really clear, like the kid's like, I'm not using a chalkboard, mom, forget it. Um, so maybe it'll be really clear and you might already know. Um, in any event, um, I want to, I always start with preliminary strokes. So the first thing being this windshield wiper. So they need to sort of learn about having their hand move across the page, which is the elbow. And then they need to learn how to do this wrist movement. Hold on one second. I have to move this box because I can't see there. Um, so they need this wrist movement. So they're trying to combine those two with this windshield wiper and you're making like a um, rainbow type of a shape. Um, then I would next, I would do this U. So it would be like U's all connected, go all the way across the board. Then you wanna do M's. Then you wanna do over and under like a wave or a ribbon. So this is differentiating between a, a, a stroke that goes up and retraces and a stroke that goes up and over and under and over and under. So you're sort of teaching them some of these basic components before you're even starting with letters. Um, the, other, the last thing would be upward loops, like an L, and then downward loops. So it's like, a, what is that like? I don't know what that's like a ribbon or something. Um, so I would teach them all of those components and see them getting comfortable with all of that. And actually one that I forgot to put on there is a zigzag because to do that, they have to push and pull the pencil like this. And that gets this distal movement. And that's really important. So you want to make it multi-sensory. You want to say it while you do it. So if you're doing a big um, cursive A on the board, you're saying, ah, Ah, apple, really big. Ah, ah, 
apple. And sometimes it's funny, they'll get really embarrassed and they like, they don't want to say it. Um, sometimes I try to make up a song. Um, if they really won't say it, I try to respect that and I say it for them. So at least they're hearing me say it. Um, you want to work on one letter at a time. At the beginning, they talk about this sort of overlearning. You really want to like C is the first letter that I would always introduce. And you, you really want to work on that over and over and over really big. And you want to make sure that they're getting that retracing so that they don't have a big, doesn't look like a wave. And you want to try to get them to be very um, specific and, and clear about what they're doing. Once they've got that C, then it's very easy to turn the C into an A or a D or a G, and then they kind of get really excited, like, wow, look how cool that is. It's like it all fits together, and then they, they learn a lot of letters pretty quickly. The same is true with, they've already done that under, under, under. They can do I, they can do T, they can do U, they can do W, all from that same pattern. So um, tracing is super important. Um, you always want to start by having them trace so that they're getting, again, that visual model beforehand. They know what they're going for, and then they're getting visual feedback afterwards where they see, oh, wait, you know, I didn't quite make it. I'm off here. But if you're doing those repetitions, and even if you're working on a C, you can do C, 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 you can make strings of them, but they want, then they can keep practicing and each repetition try to make it closer and closer. <laughs> Another really important strategy is eyes open, eyes closed, eyes open. So um, they're making it and then they close their eyes and they make it again. And then they open their eyes and they say, wow. And it's amazing. A lot of times the eyes closed one looks better than the eyes open one. And so I try to talk to them about what, well, you know, your hand can learn this. Your hand knows how to do this. And then they just get very excited, like, oh my gosh, like I can do this. So that's very cool. So um, you want to introduce a few letters and let them get some flow and then maybe start some um, little three word combinations. Um, two and three word, three letters connected. Um, you want to try to do three letter words that are like within the same group. So what I mean by that is um, I use the Hanbury King method and in that method, there's only two initial strokes. So every letter is either an overcurve letter or an undercurve letter. So initially, when you're doing the C and the D and the G, those are all overcurve letters. So when you're putting your groups together, you want to put same formation. So you want to say, um, you know, C, A, D. So they're all from the same group. Okay, next. So work in groups, keep going, next one. Here's, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna read these to you, but this is the letter order that I would do, the ones I've already talked about, the C group, then the straight line group, then I would do the looping groups, and then I would do the overcurve over groups like the N and the M, and then I leave some of these harder letters to the end. I always leave Q way till the end. Um, and I feel like Z and um, K are really hard, so I leave them to the end. So when once they've learned their letters, you need to build fluency. And one way to do that is to write the whole alphabet in order, connected, and then do it again with your eyes closed. That's very cool. You can use the trace copy cover method. So you write it for them, they trace it, then they copy it so they can see it. Then they have to cover it with their hand and write it without the visual model. Then they write it again with their eyes closed and then again with their eyes open. Um, you want to talk to them a little bit about rhythm as you're building fluency. And you want to start with a slow tempo and keep moving to get faster and faster. So um, writing words, entire words with their eyes closed is really helpful. And again, eyes closed, eyes open. Um, and there are kids that I call the trace only children. And I've had a couple of these where they, they just cannot do the motor planning piece of 
learning how the letters go. And I just have them trace. So we start with single letters, we, then we do combinations, then we do words, and they just trace on and on and on. I've, I've done it maybe like four or five months with some kids. And then it's like something connects and then they can, they can do it. So as you're introducing, when they get to a point where they have enough letters and enough writing that they can do more of it, and you're introducing it into everyday life, like those grocery lists that Catherine was talking about, um, or having them do their, their day, spelling words or doing some journaling, um, those are really good ways to build fluency. So um, some resources I wanna point out to you is Diana Hambury King that I mentioned, um, and I have in the handouts EPS description of Hanbury King's program. And I wanna just point out that this is a writing program, okay? So I'm using a small piece of it that's cursive writing, but she has a program for first graders and second graders that's about writing sentences, and it's all for kids with learning challenges. Um, writing paragraphs, writing essays, it's all, you can see the layout of it when you open that document. It's a really, really, wonderful program. Um, Loops and Other Groups is a, another great um, cursive program by an OT and a lot of her work is incorporated into the way that I work and what I've just described to you and of course Orton Gillingham. So we're going to speed through the next um, slides. Hambury King is the way to do keyboarding. It's in alphabetic order not A, S, D, F, J, K, L, S, M. She said, you say it as you do it, and you make sure they never look at the keys from the beginning. And if they really have trouble with that, you literally like make a cover for the keyboard. Um, but you can read about that in, she has books, and um, they, they're at EPS, which is on the um, handout. You just want, they all look the same. So you have to be sure you're getting the right one. You probably would need the teacher's guide, which tells you how to do the keyboarding piece and how to teach the cursive and, and all the other pieces. And then you have to get the keyboarding book and you have to get the cursive book. Um, okay, next, sorry, I'm, I know I'm running late. <laughs> keyboarding practice strategies, we're just gonna skip through those. We go to the next slide. Voice to text. I just want to say positives. It's really great for generating ideas when they're, you know, pulling a blank. Great for jotting down things. There are a lot more programs available now than there used to be, but I feel like there are some real um, negatives. Next slide. That I think um, it's a lot harder to do than you think it is. <laughs> You know, a lot of them, a lot of the kids have like funny little ways about their pronunciation or whatever. It's really not for every child. And I think there are some pitfalls with trying to use it at school. So you really have to work closely with your school team. I think a lot of kids get kind of embarrassed by it or, you know, obviously they can't be in the same room doing voice to text as all the other kids. So it can have some social ramifications. So that's what I have to say about voice to text. Um, this is an excellent excellent resource. I have um, given that also as a handout. Um, you can go to this website and purchase this for some reasonable price. I can't remember. I don't know, $12 or something, and then you just download it. Um, it's got a lot of great information about advocacy, but also about dysgraphia, a lot more technical information than kind of what I'm giving you here today. Um, and I believe that is it. Chop, chop. All right. Let's see. I am going to actually pull up some questions that came in before the webinar. Um, and we start with that and then move to questions that came in while you were speaking. Um, so Lauren asked, when children over five are pushing back on reading and writing, we need some effective strategies to turn it into a fun game or redirect. If I correct my daughter, she just emotionally breaks, even with the gentlest of correction. Yeah, so um, that's true. If, if you have a child who's five years old and is that push, pushing back on um, re writing or reading, you definitely want to get her assessed right away. Um, and in the meantime, really back off on trying to get her to perform in any way that she finds uncomfortable. 
try to set up opportunities for spontaneous writing and reading. Make little games, write her um, secret messages. Maybe she could open up in her lunchbox or open up in her, her room or something. Um, and, and try to find ways of um, you know, bringing the literacy into everyday life, I think would be good. But definitely that, that's something that needs to be looked into. It sounds like there's some anxiety issues going on there. Kids, kids know by, at least by age five, um, Joyce Pickering thinks even younger, if their um, their brains are working differently, they notice it among their um, among their peers, even in the most supportive environment, social environments where it's never been no, you know attention brought to it, they know and it starts affecting them. Um, another early question from Maddie. Um, she asked, "What free resources would you recommend for beginners? Is there a specific order in which we introduce diagraphs and other sounds?" Um, an informative guide for parents to teach reading to their kids at home would be invaluable. Yeah, there's, oh my, there's, that's a huge topic. Um, there absolutely is an, an order and maybe, you know, there's probably several opinions about different orders, all of which are better than just random. <laughs> so um, in the Montessori classroom, they definitely have an order that they use. Orton Gillingham has an order. Barbara has a great order for the, um, the writing development piece. Um, and in terms of resources that, you know, the one I can think of, um, if you have a child that you is really struggling with reading and writing and they're maybe, you know, five or older, um, my Orton trainer, Fran Bauman, who's an Orton fellow, she developed a, um, uh, it, it's an app or, um, for an iPad or, you know, and they, I think there's a computer version now. Um, and yeah, there it is, Ogstar Reading, and it's the it's the full Orton program. So it it's not as good as um, a one-on-one -on -one tutor. There's nothing that can replace a one-on-one -on -one tutor. But she just kn knew that over the years, so many families don't have any access to an Orton tutor, and it's very very expensive. Um, and so this is something that you can look into. It's really you get an entire year for the cost of um, you know, one tutoring session, it's, it's worth looking at and it ha it's a full Orton program. So that's one thing you could look into. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, let's see, let me revisit our questions tab here. I just saw a great one. Where did I go? Here it is. Um, my son is a great reader, seven years old, but struggles immensely with writing. We started this summer doing the handwriting without tears system, which sounds very similar to the approach that you described. He would heavily, or he heavily resists handwriting work in general. Do you have any tips to help motivate him to try? Yeah, I mean, that's really tough. I think um, they do get this kind of psychological negativity, like, you know, that it's so hard. Um, and I would definitely do things like, you know, um, rolling out Play-Doh, making, um, you know, Play-Doh snakes and using those to form letters. Um, I would do things that he might think are crazy, like, you know, let's put chocolate pudding on the counter and use your finger, um, you know, so he's got like, you know, some sensory and some reward and, and boy, isn't this crazy? What are we doing? Um, you can put, um, take the, a little, tray like a little um glad plastic container and put um, sand in it you can get like really pretty colored sands at some of the craft stores and see if he could you know make a little writing tray for him to practice like that um a really good cue or really the good strategy is to think about especially if you have a chalkboard or even a whiteboard is that erasing is easier than writing so sometimes if you write a letter and you give them a little wet sponge on the blackboard and see if they can trace it, but erase it. So they want to try to get rid of all the marks that you made. And the same is true on the whiteboard. You can get little caps that are erasers for the back ends of the dry erase markers. So then they can take that and they can trace over. So those would be a few ideas that come to mind you know, right off the top of my head, uh, trying to make it fun, you know, is, is really important. And um, ha have you seen the handwriting without tears, um, wooden letter 
pieces. I don't know, you may or may not already have those, but um, that really helps them in terms of having like kind of a three-dimensional concrete representation of how those letters are formed and they can feel it and they can touch it and put them together. Sure. Um, Emily asked, at what age does dyslexia become apparent versus the child just starting out learning to write and spelling backwards? Hmm. So um, dyslexia is, is more noticeable in the auditory processing um, arena. So um, the, the writing backwards can be normal up until I think age six or seven. Um, but so a better indicator is actually phonological awareness ex exercises and seeing can they rhyme? Can they, um, can they repeat nursery rhymes? Can they pick up, can they give you a rhyming word? You say cat, and you know, can they come up with mat? Um, if you give them two words and say, do those rhyme? And uh, they, can they tell you yes or no? Um, so by age, around age four, uh, there are assessments that can pick up if a child is at risk. At that age, they would call it at risk for a language learning disability. Um, and if the brain difference is just mild, then and a really rich environment like the Montessori environment may be all they need as long as they're they're really getting that um, daily literacy work. Um, but if they are have significantly um, disrupted brain uh, channels, then they're gonna they're gonna need the Orton tutoring. And, and the sooner you can get in, the better. They've done studies. Um, kids who get daily Orton uh, at age four. Um, if after a year of interventions, they they do an MRI and post and their brains are processing language in a much more typical fashion than they were previously. So um, just like Montessori pointed out a hundred years ago, you know, while the brain is still malleable and form, forming and growing, that's the best time to get in and start looking at, um, is there something different here? Um, so, I mean, just so you understand, dyslexia, they've traced it all the way back. To, it's evident by the fifth month of pregnancy. It's, it's genetic. Um, it, when the uh, neurons are migrating to the outer part of the brain, they, instead of stopping and forming um, the outer layer, they break through. So um, they've looked at the brain's postmortem of dyslexics, and they actually have these holes in their brains. They're called ectopias. Um, and when you have that kind of disruption in the way the brain is being formed, it impacts a lot of areas. And um, so um, that, that it is a real struggle. So, yeah. Thank you. Therese asks, do you have any advice for getting a diagnosis of dysgraphia? I have a seven-year-old that is a strong reader, but has problems with handwriting and spelling. Some teachers have pointed to fine motor skills, but how do you distinguish the source of the issue? You need an OT evaluation, and you need probably a comprehensive OT evaluation from the private sector. Now, of course, that's my bias. I'm in the private sector, but I've also worked in the schools, and you know, you have to recognize that at the school, they have a slightly different mandate, and their mandate is really just about trying to help the child succeed at school, not really treating the underlying issue. So um, when you get an OT evaluation in, in the private sector, they're going to be trying to look at definitely what's going on with those hands. You know, are, are those hand muscles developed enough to be ready to be holding a pencil? But they're also going to be looking at what is the visual perceptual situation you know, if I see a rectangle and I see a square, that does my brain differentiate that? If I don't differentiate those two as different, then it's going to be awfully hard for me to understand what's a U and what's a V, or, you know, the difference between an N and a U. So um, we'll, we would look at that. We will look at also the eye-hand um, coordination, the connection between the eyes and the hands. We will be looking at this um, sequencing capabilities. So can the child kind of learn a sequence and remember it um, motorically? So, the, you know, the school isn't going to give you that kind of a deep um, dive into that. And um, you really do need to find out. I've had people come to me and say, well, you know, can't you just do a quick little look at my kid and help me figure it out? And it's like, no, I, I can't. I need to look at 
And even you need to look at the trunk and you need to look at gross motor, you know, is the trunk and the shoulder stability there? You can't have distal control at your fingertips if you don't have stability here and here and at your elbow and at your shoulder and in your trunk. And so the question is kind of where are things breaking down and why? And, you know, and your child might have trouble with several of those things or maybe just one or two. So it's really important to get that really good evaluation. I have a couple of school language questions. Emily asked, my child is in Mandarin in an amend in, in, a in a Mandarin immersion classroom, I'm having trouble today. And so typically writes and reads from right to left. In English, he is also writing backwards and spelling right to left. How do I know if he's dyslexic or just confusing the two language structures? Oh. <laughs> okay, um, so there's a lot of confusion about dyslexia that people think it's um, reading backwards and sometimes it is, but that turns out to be a pretty small percentage. So, um, but, it, but the left to right and right to left is really important. We know that um, in the Montessori classroom, Dr. Montessori pre-teaches that way before they're doing writing. So even in the table washing, table washing is from, is in the direction of writing for that culture. So it's in English, it's, you know, left to right, top to bottom. But if you're reading and writing in a different direction, then it would be in that different direction. So um, that that is that is a big thing to consider. Um, I mean, ideally, if you really if you really feel that there's some other um, the child is not making the, the the same progress or you have real concerns, some it, with Chinese it might be hard to find, but some speech and language pathologists will um, will be able to do an evaluation which will help you to, to say, is my child on a normal track of development or is this does this have to do with uh, reading and writing in different directions? But um, yeah, I mean, overall children who learn two languages, you know, it's complex at the beginning, it's hard work for the brain, but of course we know that hard means strong, right? So you build, they're building more brain muscles, they're building, um, you know, brain powers around language that children who only have one language won't have. So it's 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 never something where you, oh you want to not you want to limit their exposure, but um, you you will want to try to find out sooner rather than later if there is something else going on. Is what I would say. Uh, Lisa asked, my son resists even hearing me read a story to him, much less having him read the book. Is this part of the same refusal to read and write, or could this be attributed to something else? So is it is the question the child won't sit for a story? Right, or read it, either one. Yeah, that might be an attentional issue. Um, I mean, that would be something to, to consider. Um, I, you know, it, it's hard to say without observing and seeing what is going on in the environment at the time. Um, what is going on in terms of the flow of the child's day? Um, what is the age again? Oh, sorry. I scrolled down and I'm, I'm looking at a different question. Um, uh, actually, I don't think I have it up anymore. I'm sorry. If, okay. If you have a question asker, if you could chime in. Yeah. Oh, she's nine, developmentally about six. Developmentally six and age nine and won't sit through a story. Yeah, that's definitely something to, to look into, but it sounds like there's a tension or possibly um, sensory sensory motor issues. I would definitely look at, um, have an OT, the first place would be an OT evaluation. Right, Barbara? <laughs> what do you think of pencil grips that are meant to help the child hold the pencil correctly? Do these help or do they act as a crutch? It's a complicated question <laughs> because it's different for every child, but um, in some instances they can be super helpful. Um, and in in a, I wouldn't, I don't know, I wouldn't worry about the crutch as much as a lot of times the kids like their their um, grip is so dysfunctional that they'll just like go ahead and put their dysfunctional grip like on top of the pencil grip, you know. So 
for some kids, they just aren't helpful. Where's my pencil? I have a pencil here. Um, one of the things that um, is this, I'm sorry, I'm so confused about where my camera is and what direction is which, but so this is a like an alternative grip that really, the, the key thing that's important is to keep this uh, web space open. I can't even find my own hand. Okay. <laughs> so, so a lot of times the things that the kids are doing that's really dysfunctional is shutting down this web space. And so when you do that, if you try that with your hand right now, it's like the only place to move is from your wrist. So you don't have good pencil control because your hand is just functioning like a block. If you can get this bone away from your hand so that you have a C shape and this nice web space, then you can move your hand and do all kinds of things. So, and that's what those pencil grippers are trying to do is get the hand into a position where you're maintaining the web space. So, you know, if the child's overriding the grip, what I would call, like the grip is there and they're just doing their own, you know, funky whatever it is that they do on top of the grip, that's like useless. Um, this company called The Pencil Grip um, has a three stage, you know, grip series that's really cool. Um, and it does kind of, the, the first piece has like a hood and everything. It's really, really um, tells the hand where to be. And then the second stage is basically the same underneath, but without that hood. And then the third one is even smaller. So you can sort of back them out of having that support um, with that three-step series. Um, but there are so many different pencil grips and there are so many different problems that are causing the funky pencil grips. And it really depends on the age of the child to a large degree. It's really hard to change a pencil grip if they're older and you might do better to get them to actually try this one where they go, but you put the pencil between the two fingers and then hold it like that. But you have to then go through a whole kind of series of activities where they just scribble and just get the feeling, you know, used to the feeling of the pencil between the first two fingers. It's kind of complicated. So I don't know if I'm really answering your question or not, but the bottom line is if you try a few things and it doesn't kind of help right away, then you might need to consult with an OT and get some advice because it's very unique to each child. Thank you. Are there typical age milestones for reading and writing? I know that's a, that's a big question and we're here at the end, but. <laughs> so um, <laughs> Dr. Montessori talks about that in her early writings. Um, so it, it depends on their experiences. Um, the one thing that she noticed was through her lack of biases about what a child could and couldn't do, um, her children in, in the Casa dei Bambini, the these are typical children um, for the most part, but they spontaneously began to read and write, you know, about two years younger than the typical child. And, and that's been my observation of kids in Montessori. If they start at age three in the Casa and they go through that, um, you know, the wonderful program, um, it's usually about two years um, in advance of a, of a typical child. So one of the things you have to consider is if you have a five-year-old who's never been in Montessori before and is just starting um, reading and writing versus if you have a child who's been in Montessori since three and is not reading and writing after two or three years, that's a big indicator because Montessori is really developmental and therapeutic and, and, and rich and, and develops, um, it has the, all the basic components of, um, of Orton in it. And it's so children learn to read and write or write and read earlier um, and love to do it. And so if the child is five and isn't loving reading and writing and, and able to do it, in a, if they've been in Montessori, that's a much bigger red flag than if they've been in another um, type of preschool or kindergarten environment where, you know, they just, they have a different approach and it's not as effective. So that's what I'd say about it. <laughs> All right. I think we might have time for one more question um, before we close out. I know that I was not able to get to everyone's questions, um, but if anybody 
it's not like an answer, please do just respond to the invitation to the webinar um, or the follow-up email, and I can get these questions to Barbara or Catherine, um, or if I think I can answer them myself, I will, um, but I'll most likely forward them on. So my last question, Emily asked, I have avoided correct correcting my child when they write backwards or spell backwards because I don't want to discourage them, um, and her child is four. I have focused on modeling the correct way in my own writing. Should I be more active in correcting? I don't think so yeah, for a four-year-old. I, I right. think that sounds just right for that well, age. Do you concur, Catherine? Yeah, and I would also um, go large motor. So I would, um, even if you don't have room for, I, I think every family should have a large chalkboard or whiteboard. <laughs> But if you don't have one of those, an easel, even a child size easel, and have them do the letters, um, one letter for an entire page or the entire um, easel, and start working it that way. Because sometimes it's just they're missing um, seeing the detail of the letter. And to draw their attention to the specific details, if they do it really big. So you would model it first. So if they're working on A, you know, you would put A and try to go for at least a foot and a half, um, and then have them trace it. We call it making rainbow letters. So they get to choose a whole bunch of different colors and do it one time with each color while they're saying, ah. And, um, and so that, you know, then you'll, st you'll learn more. Basically, you know, that it's a question that, that, you, um, th that you need to observe and um, try different things and see, and if it, if it persists, you might want to have it have you know, have it looked into, but if that's the only you know if that's the only thing, I think the the large writing um, will bring the attention to um, to that that difference. It, if it's a visual perceptual um, dysfunction or something, that's an OT would be able to to identify anything else. But um, yeah, I would I just try to go big. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, um, Catherine and Barbara, for joining us again and sharing your expertise. And again, if we didn't get to your question, I apologize. I think we could have done this in double the time or more and still wouldn't have gotten to all of them because there are so many great questions here. Um, so please do follow up and I'll, I'll direct questions their way. Um, and if you haven't had a chance to download the handouts, you can do so. There's a little drop down for the handouts that might be collapsed on your menu. Um, and if you're not able to figure that out or don't don't have time or you're watching this in a recording, um, you can just send me an email and I'm happy to get them to you. Um, my email for the recording is kateharan at two as in to higherground.com. So thank you again and uh, we appreciate all of your expertise. Bye, thank, thank you, you so for much. coming. It was a pleasure. All right. Thanks for having us, Kelly. Yes, absolutely.